I am speaking today across the pond to uh, expatriate Kristen Perrin. How are you doing, Kristen? I'm doing really well. Thank you, Bill. I'm really pleased to be here. Well, it's good to have you. Uh, Kristen is originally from my current haunts, the Washington State. I live in Seattle. So uh, we don't get into it too much, but you got your education here in the Seattle area. Is that correct? Or what? Uh, no, I I went. Well, that's part of the reason why I'm abroad is my education. But um, I was born and raised in Issaquah. Uh, well, I, I was born in Brenton, um, yeah. raised in Issaquah. Um, that's why you get a little bit of a Twin Peaks flavor in my books. <laughs> um, definitely, I'm a big fan of that. But it's not it's not the same vibe. But um, but yeah, and then I um, left to pursue a master's degree after doing undergrad um, in at a liberal arts uh, college in Idaho, and then went to the UK to do a master's in international relations. Um, oh, met okay. my husband, stayed, did a PhD, then had a, a career change. Um, You're a smart yeah. pants. So you went over there, international relations. Okay. So, mm -hmm. and you meet your guy, you get married yep. and he mm -hmm. says, stay here. Don't leave, please. <laughs> I can't go over there. They won't like my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I, I think really it was probably more me because, and, and I think the flavor of my writing reflects this. As soon as I stepped off the plane, I think I was really just like, I, I don't think I'm going to want to go back. Wow. Um, okay. But I, but like now that I'm older, I, I, I really miss Washington state actually. I'm really finding. And I think a lot of the, the, you know, release of my book and the traction I'm getting in the U S um, writing from like a British point of view mm -hmm. has made me kind of homesick, which I was not expecting. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So, well, you don't know, keep changing. So, uh, okay. So, but you, you go to college for international mm -hmm. relations. That's what you want to get your yeah. master's in. Yes. Yeah. So, all right. You're academic, hard driving, a student, I suspect. Oh. And so, but writers like to write and usually they kind of always do. Of course, in the liberal arts, even in the sciences, I don't know where that falls into, somewhere between liberal arts and sciences. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Writing is essential. Of course, you're always writing, but it's different. Yeah. Uh, so were you a creative writer, even as a young lass? Were you always writing, um, scribbling poems and stories? How was your, what was your relationship yeah. to that? Well, yeah, I, I really was. Um, I think... One of the things, and I've been talking about this with a lot of my fellow writer friends of, of my generation, I think I fell prey to something that, I mean, and I think it came at at this generation with the best, I'm an elder millennial for, for those out listening who are wondering, like, how old is Get this that lady? people. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so I, I fell prey to this... Uh, that our teachers, our parents, I think it came from a really well-meaning place. But there was a lot of this creative pursuits will not get you a job. You cannot live off of creativity. Hey, and can I, I can I can I interrupt you for just a moment and say this is advice that has been handed down to people for thousands of years. Many, many <laughs> I don't years. Think it you know, with, <laughs> but maybe honest, I'm wrong. Maybe honestly, I'm... some sometimes when I feel a bit like head up about this and about how much time I spent spinning my wheels, you know, trying not to write and eventually succumbing to like the desire yeah. to write. I, I watched this TED talk with um it's um Sir Ken Robinson oh, and he I, I know Sir Ken Robinson. He's a lovely guy. I, I interviewed him twice. He's great. We really oh, got along. I, yeah. Do you know that um that TED talk that, that he did years ago yes, that is yeah. is education yep. killing creativity. Yeah. Um it just really hit home. Um I didn't write for many years. I wrote as a young child. I loved poetry. I I loved writing little rhyming couplets. I loved writing right. stories and things as a child. And then as soon as I got into school where you're you're kind of meant to find what you're good at. And because yeah. I was able to like write a persuasive essay and sure. do some research and, you know, have a healthy debate, yep. it was sort of, well, this is what you should do because you yeah. can. Yeah. Um, and that propelled me all the way through, through a PhD. Now that doesn't mean I didn't love that too. I right. definitely had passion for that. I don't think you can get all the way through, although I do know PhD students who don't have passion for what they're doing. 
Um, but I think it would be very hard to get through the type of PhD that I did without feeling, you know, very driven by the subject matter. Um, so, so that is yeah. interesting. So that's interesting. And and I'll tell you that this is a, a conversation I've had with many artists and the issue of money and those, you know, there's some artists who just like, I, I can't do anything but this. And I don't know how to make money at it, but I'm screwed if I can't make money because I can't yeah. be a, a barrister and I can't be a doctor. Yeah. I can only do this, but there's a lot of people yeah. can do a lot of things. And so this is a debate. And so if you don't mind me asking, what were your parents? What did they do with their time? They uh, so my mom was an accountant for the Boeing company, which is mm -hmm. you know Seattle. Yeah. My dad, my dad was in computers, um, right. similar so with, with the Seattle kind of yeah. yeah. Um, and it was a very yeah, and it was a very um the way that that a lot of people's parents around me understood what a what a comfortable life meant was you know this a, a very organized yeah corporate thing, and it was safe. I think that's yeah. why. And our teachers told, you know, our teachers, you know, definitely fed this to us as, as sure. well. It, this is a safe choice. You know, you won't go hungry. That's um, true. But yeah, so, but but for me, finding academia was like a sort of middle ground because you, it you is. can be creative in academia. And it's life of the mind and you're having your own thoughts and you're exploring those thoughts. It's not totally removed from creative writing, at least because you are thinking for a living in a way, right? You're thinking about yeah. you're thinking about things. Yeah. Absolutely. And and I remember as well in like when I was doing my PhD research and I I I was um giving my first talk ever, you know, they they kind of get you in early to do some yeah. talks to kind of season you up because you're training to be a lecturer, you're training to be a professor, right. you know, that's right. pretty much what you can do. If you're in in well, you know, international relations, I was studying um uh criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia I was in oh uh, oh cheery yeah it, <laughs> this is why I turned to creative writing um I um yeah I remember my supervisor kind of going you know you really come at this in a in a in a kind of bizarre but yet very innovatively creative oh room. already and so I was already kind of zigging and zagging around what normal people would do really methodically and um and and the the other you know coming back to why I I started writing again because that was during my PhD was when I started writing again and I started writing like during, I, during your PhD but, <laughs> yes when you're well, doing I, all I, this writing anyway I know wow I, I started writing like I was a starving person and that was my food like it was just wow. um uh and it was because a friend of mine who was also doing a PhD and was also doing a subject matter that was really dark. You know, she was studying radicalization of, of youths um, and, and you know, how that wow. happened. Yeah. And she was just like, we would get to the end of our days and we would go, you know, this is, this is London. We'd go and have a pint. Yep. I, we would just be, I, I would just be like, the, the world is not okay. Like we're, right. we're just like, you know, my data <sighs> set was war crimes tribunal. So I spent hours a day reading these transcripts, which are really harrowing. And she dragged me to the students' union building, and said, "You have to join a club." I she joined the fashion society, and she was sewing things. <laughs> okay, she was like you have to find something that is not this. Yeah, and you have to join. And we just I remember flipping through the pages of like, what are the clubs that exist? This is at University College London, so there's right. quite a lot. It's a very big university, and I was like, you know, I. I I saw creative writing there and I was like, could I, could I, Oh, I don't, I, I had this oh. imposter syndrome already, but then I thought, no, I, I have to, I'm going to do that. And I joined the creative writing society. I was like with all these creative writing master students who were doing this extra, right. and I basically leached off of them for information on how, you know, wow. they were, you know, all of this, all of this stuff they were learning on their master's programs I would show up out of hours and just talk to them about and and kind wow. of sponge the you know the the information off on, on on so I learned so much um from um from just going to those to those meetings um and do you, and yeah. were you writing at the same time were you letting yourself write stuff or yeah. and now your first published works mm -hmm. books were were middle grade yes. uh, but did you start writing that kind of stuff or cuz usually we start writing about people our own age that's the most natural thing or did you go write for children's stuff 
Um, when I was doing my PhD, I started writing. I actually started where I ended up. I started writing a murder mystery, but it was like very philosophical. I was trying right. to be extremely literary. Okay. Uh, because I felt like, you know, oh, I'm a PhD student. And I was oh, hanging yeah. out. All of these, all of these creative writing students were just so bright and so articulate. And I just felt this literary scene in in yeah. um uh the the writing society at the time was headed up by um, Naomi Ishiguro, who writes. Um, she's the daughter of Kajo Ishiguro, and, um, and so it was a pretty heady bunch. Yeah, it was a very talented, talented group. Naomi has a collection of short stories that is amazing, and she has another um, work of fiction out. Um, it, it, yeah, she's a very talented writer, and I was just, yeah, a bit out of my depth, but I was trying to be, you know, like like them. Um, and I got like 20,000 words into a book that will never see the light of day as you do. Um, and children's was what helped me find my feet because years and years and years ago, when I was growing up, my main job, not when I was growing up, but like when I was in high school and then when I was in college, I would kind of continue to come back to this, this job. And I was a children's bookseller in Barnes and Noble Issaquah. Oh, no kidding. So, Yep, there was a time that I ran the children's section. Um, I did oh. the like midnight release parties for the Harry really? Potter really couple of years. Yeah, oh. so you got uh, a little view of the world of publishing, just a little view from behind yeah. the scenes, a little bit. Yeah, I yeah, I got to do story times. I got to just see what books kids wanted, and I got to see how parents bought books for their kids and right. what adults were asking for versus what children were wanting and and then I also just read a lot of children's literature just because that was the section I was in there were times right. where kids were in school but I was working um <laughs> and the children's section was dead um, <laughs> and I just read a lot of of children's literature mostly middle grade which is for eight to ten year olds and yeah. I just got enchanted by that yeah age bracket and and um so when I actually thought about what fit for me to to write and I because I came back to that they Barnes and Noble Issaquah let me show up in between like breaks and summers and you know they just kept letting me just come back and work nice. there nice. um so I was like a little ghost that would kind of haunt the Barnes and Noble and you know eventually disappear and float back when I had another break from a degree um and and yeah, it, it just, I think it was just such a positive time. I really enjoyed yeah. my job there that that um, fueled, you know, I, that was, I think I felt like this is achievable. Children's literature to me feels achievable. Oh, that's interesting. And that's, I do think it's so important that we have to make it achievable because some people could argue, you could always create an argument for why something isn't, but by deciding that it is, it just psychologically something breaks down that allows you to do it, I think. So that, what a great little trick you played on yourself <laughs> you know? yeah. I didn't I didn't know I was doing it at the time but I think that sometimes um I think a lot of writers can benefit towards just letting yourself gravitate towards a comfort zone Abs and oh you've all be got comfortable yeah. also it allowed you to drop because here's the thing literary fiction is fine but it's like anything else you got to be on board with what it is it's mm -hmm. got to be what you want to do. It's got to be how you want to tell stories. You got to be into yeah. it. And yeah. unfortunately, literary fiction exists in a place all by itself where, yeah. you know, it's kind of, can you do it? And it's the best, mm -hmm. and it's all, which is all, none of which is true, but it just is right for some people and not others. And at least when you go to middle grade, mm -hmm. you have to drop all that kind of stuff because you're yeah. writing for children and mm -hmm. <laughs> you're allowed not to be tragic. In fact, yeah. really can't be. And yeah. I always say, I well, wish I, I, we would I, tell stories to ourselves, us adults, the way we will tell them to children sometimes. sometimes. Yeah. I would argue, I would push back a little bit on the tragic comment, because I would argue that some of the books that have broken my heart the most have been children's books. Uh -huh. there oh, are interesting. Some children's books, there are some children's books out there that I was Even like, for wow, that grade level? Definitely going to cry now. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Off right. the top of my head children's books that I cried at the end of quite quite openly would be um The House with Chicken Legs by Sophie Anderson 
um the graveyard book by uh, oh Yogi. oh yeah, yeah um just i mean, it might just be that i'm a big softy that's also part of it that's okay uh, but i stand corrected there's more <laughs> there's more range but but I in mean, general I, I, with literary fiction for adults there is this sort of affinity for tragedy i think mm. you know there's a kind of yes. sense like that's what makes it and now but eh, yes. let's yes. be honest there's a lot of it and so uh yeah. Yeah. um and I, and I think you know what's it's really interesting that you kind of um peg that that uh tragic element with literary because um one of the things that took me a little while to land in my cozy crime comfort zone um was this this feeling that um that basically something that is is comfortable isn't important and something that is comfortable isn't um isn't providing what literature should provide for people right and i i definitely disagree with myself in that and it took me a while to to kind of go, you know, I, I, I there are times when, you know, because the other thing is, is there is this very literary versus commercial divide. And, and yeah. I struggled for a while to kind of go, well, you know what? I am occupying a very commercial space now with my murder mysteries. Um, right. And, you know, I had come from this academic, you know, kind of, oh, if I, you know. That's and, because and literature and academia are starting to get kind of all twisted up together sometimes. Yeah, there's a, yeah. There's, a, there's a kind of overlap with that. Yeah, they really are. And it sort of circles back to this idea of if you can do it, you should do it. Um, and I kind of think, well, could I write literary fiction if I wanted to try to do it? I could put my mind to it and I could probably produce something. I don't know what it would be or where it would go. But that doesn't mean that I should, um, you no. know, and and so, yeah, so I think I think being in this commercial, I, I was talking to a I have a, a, a writing community, you know, a group of fellow writers that I have um, the crime writing community in particular has been really the kid, the children's literature community and the crime writing community are really wonderful, helpful spaces. Yeah, yeah. that They're doesn't surprise me. Yeah. They're non-competitive. Crime yeah. writer, crime writers are uh, like the, there's a I think because the readers, both in Kidlet and Crime, are voracious. Yeah. And you, yeah. you're never gonna be competing against your fellow writers because your readers will read something in a day. <laughs> oh gosh, I want more of the same thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or yeah. I want more of that, but you know, maybe like this. You know, it just right. and they're fearless as well. They'll pick That's... up, they'll they'll look around, they'll just they'll grab stuff off the shelves. And so I think it, yeah. So I was talking to a, a writer, a friend of mine, and we were talking about commercial fiction and she was describing it as, um, you know, it's not going to change your life, but I enjoyed it. And I thought, you know, sometimes you like your life the way it is and you want to reach for something that's not going to push on that. Also, I, I, I've, the more I've been living and writing and talking to writers and talking the, the point to life is to find what you enjoy the, mm -hmm. you know nothing should be medicine it, it either yeah. uplifts you there are certain stories i won't watch anymore i won't watch stories about nazis i won't yeah. watch anymore i mean it's okay the, the stories had to be told but i don't need i don't want that story anymore or slavery i yeah. won't watch those anymore it's not that they shouldn't be told but mm -hmm. it doesn't take me where i want to be taken sometimes mm -hmm. you know what it reminds me of is that for a while, I read tragic love stories. It's sort of when I really they moved me because I had had a somewhat tragic relationship to romance until I married this person at a relatively young age and and have been with her ever since. And I really I couldn't have that relationship to love to romantic love. I kept mm -hmm. trying to write stories like that, but it wasn't an accurate representation of life as I live it. And I, yeah. it was a, it was a hard change for me to start writing about life the way I actually experienced it, as to how mm -hmm. I had read about it when I was a young man in the novels I had loved at that time. Does that make yeah. sense? It does. It's really interesting as well because I think that what you said uh, in in like the the first half and then the latter half could be split into two parts because yeah. it's about kind of our relationship to what we consume and yeah. our relationship to what we what we create. Yeah. And, so in terms of consuming difficult stories now, and this is possibly because I come from, you know, a, a genocide studies PhD, I, I, I do tend to gravitate towards cozy things or whimsical things or, 
uh, things that make me feel comfortable, but I do make a point to push myself um, because I think that if I get too stuck in a cozy space, I may um, be doing myself a great disservice in terms of, I don't want to crystallize into a person who, you know, even, even if stories of, um, I've interacted with some version of a story before, and I think I've heard it all. Right. I don't ever really want to close that door. I can understand a lot of people who will say, you know what? I have actually consumed a lot of that, and I feel like I need something else now. That's completely fair. Um, and and I say, like, this is just the way that my mind works is that I, I do definitely have... Um, I, I'm someone who who gravitates towards stories that have... Uh, you know, a, a pulse of challenge and, you know, themes of social justice or, you know, I, right. I, that's, that's kind of, but, you know, I'll, I'll draw a line right there and go into what we create because I think the way that we view the world, when you say, you know, the way that you, you know, looked at romance and love stories based on the life that you're living, I definitely think that we change as people and that our work should reflect that. Oh, and, absolutely. Um, and, and you know, oftentimes with writing middle grade, I'm writing from a first person point of view of a 12 year old. And it's not a 12 year old who was a 12 year old when I was a 12 year old in like the 1990s. Right. This is one who, you know, it's, it's, it's a modern book. And I need to think about, you know, the way being 12 can be universally experienced no matter what, you know, time we're yeah. in. And I am, you know, I am, I am a 42 year old woman. Um, and, and that is something that is a real stretch sometimes and that yeah. it can be extremely challenging. It can be energizing when you, when you tap into something um, because you can tap into like an old version of you that, yeah. you know, can, can give you a lot to work with. Um but the you, you know, the the you now um, can write it in a way that is a lot more clear and um, interesting and emotionally relevant than, yeah. you know, a, a, some a version of you, you know, yeah. all the way back, you know, or even, you know, if I was in my early 20s trying to write about a 12 year old, I I don't think that I would hit the emotional beats in the way... Oh that it should no. work for a for a, a middle grade novel i don't think i was ready to be able to have the insights having the insights that i do now having children of my own um you know and i don't think you need to have children to write children's literature no you don't i mean dr seuss famously said yeah, I'll yeah. entertain them you you raise them <laughs> yeah you know it's interesting i have a theory about comfort zones because i'm all for comfort i never in my life want to be uncomfortable mm. like it ever but it doesn't mean I want to be bored either. That's uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I always I feel like you shouldn't. It's, I don't want to get out of my comfort zone, but I want to mm -hmm. keep up with it because I feel like it keeps moving because mm -hmm. I keep mm -hmm. growing. And when I get restless, it's when I keep doing the same things. I've been or writing the same kind of things, or mm -hmm. and and in fact, what I'm wanting is 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 moving ahead, and I'm not staying with it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I think. I think that it, it it goes back to this idea of like I when I say I don't want to crystallize into yeah, one yeah. person, one version yeah. of myself and have that be it. And I actually have noticed because you know, progressing into your 40s and 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 beyond, for me, it's created this sort of sense uh, a line where you you're looking back a little bit more than you're looking sure. ahead and you're thinking about, you know, um how you know you are as a pro all these all these introspective things that come with just getting older yeah. and i'm sure that i have a lot of that ahead of me i hope i have a lot of that ahead of me um but i think that um when it comes to writing and my relationship with writing and my relationship with comfort zones my books if i don't if i don't push my own comfort zones and my own just levels of of curiosity out my books are going to stagnate sure. what i create is going to stagnate and then me as the person i just will pr probably just be the person who just has the same anecdotes all the time and right. you know, doesn't really have a lot to offer um 
it's harder though as you get older because you go well this is working for me I'm that's right well you you on to it i figured out adulthood you know it's interesting yeah. but i think in, for the first you know 30 middle 30s and the close the journey is always out in a way the job mm -hmm. the partner the family mm -hmm. the house it's out it's exploring but right about where you are now is when it starts to be go in because yeah. usually maybe you're living in one if you're not someone who's traveling the world all the time you tend to have settled somewhere and maybe into some work and with the same person but it doesn't mean the journey stops it just goes in and yeah. what better life than the writer because i always say to my students i'm like look man you sit down and there's nothing to react to there's nothing to interact with but your imagination in that yeah. story it's just you and your thoughts yeah mm -hmm. and you have to find there has to be all you need has to be right there mm -hmm. and the blank page right yes yes and i think i think that's a thing about you know of people who naturally live in their imagination I, there are a lot of people who want to be writers and i think that you know i think that some of us who have always lived in our heads quite a bit because we get bored at you know and, yes. and i was always one of these people who sits in a class and i would kind of go all right i don't really want to listen to this it was usually yes. math yeah. <laughs> and I honestly would like the teacher reports that would come back at, all the way through from elementary school would be like, gosh, she just sort of stares out the window a lot. You know, is she OK? <laughs> um, and honestly, it was because I was just somewhere else. Yeah. Um, yep. And I I thought of that as being a bad thing for a really long time. Like, oh, my focus is so bad. And now I realize with my it's an essential part of my writing process where I just have to have quiet, where my phone is in another room. I am just in my own head. And, you know, I can be doing something else at the same time that is very basic and mundane. But, you know, doing dishes or right, going, on right, a, right. going on a walk is a good one. Yeah. You know, um, but, but I need to have a, a large amount of time in my own head. Yeah. Um, oh. Or I will or I will take it. Or I will take it when someone else, you know, when I get overwhelmed or there's just too many things going on, I will find myself just clicking out and being like I'm You know, so it's so interesting cuz I work with I teach and but mostly what I teach is sort of the emotional psychological challenges of writing. I don't get into craft mm. that much. Um mm -hmm. and a lot of times I work it, for women, not all, but the women who come to me for help, it, mm -hmm. the thing they often I would say they're most likely to have the problem of, I don't feel comfortable closing the door and not taking care of being there for people and being, and the writers I know, men and women who really thrive, do not have a problem closing <laughs> that door. They're like, look, man, I'm going to do it and I'm going to be alone and I'm not going to feel guilty about it. And that's something yeah. to teach yeah. them to not feel guilty about wanting to yeah. be alone and, and pursue their own interests. Yeah. Does that resonate? I yeah, it really does, because also it took me a number of years. And I think I realized this possibly during my PhD. I had my kids while I was doing my, that's another oh thing. I was very God. busy. <laughs> um, I, uh, well, I had my daughter partway through and then I had my son just after. But, um, but I realized that the time spent in my own head or doing something that was for my professional life or for myself, um, I was just a better person all around. When That's I right. That's that right. Into, you know, I was a better, I'm a better mom. I'm a better, you know, partner to my husband. You know, I just, right. it just, it, 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 and I think that that, that feels pretty universal. I don't, I've, I've never met a person who said, you know, oh yeah, no, I'm a, I feel like I'm a worse person when I actually well, I write. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I really, um, I find it really interesting that you teach the emotional and like, uh, psychological side of, that's really fascinating to me because one of the things that is a common question I've been asked. So I'm, um, just for the people listening, I am, I am a very new to this, this whole talking about my work process right. because while I wrote middle grade for a number of years, it was only sold in translation. So it meant it, it was only a wow. uh, German, Polish, and Dutch. Yeah, um, because we went on submission with these books. My agent, uh, you know, who's brilliant, took them out on submission to editors. Um, and and the pandemic, when it was the very beginning and we were locking down, happened like literally uh, days later, a week later. Wow. 
Yeah. Um, and then everything just really went sideways, but the countries that were still sort of functioning because we were sort of just on the edge of, is it in Europe? It was like, is it just going to be in Italy? Like, right, is, it just, right. is the pandemic going to be? It was that right. time. Um, and so I sold in Germany, I sold in the Netherlands and I sold in Poland. Um, wow. and so I could not ever for all of that, I was making a kind of quiet, you know, small living, um, just writing books that were then translated and I hadn't, didn't have to do any trips or events or Much. interviews or anything like that. Weird. There were times, there were times when, um, uh, I'd get tagged on Instagram because somebody would, you know, some lovely reader would right. you know write something all in Dutch and show a picture of the book and I didn't know it was even out. Um, <laughs> look, it's my book. It's on the show. Um, so this is a, this is a whole new thing to me. And so one of the questions that is coming up a lot is what advice would you give? That's right. To That's writers? right. Yep. And, um, you know, I've listened to a lot of writing podcasts. I've read a lot of writing advice blogs. I've read books on writing. And, yeah. and a lot of the advice kind of is very circular. And yeah. the one thing that for me always feels like the best advice is to figure out as much as you can how your relationship with your, your mind is and Good. how your relationship with your general just sense of self and well-being and emotions and and mental capacity how all of that balances that's right because i think that once you learn how you function how you how you how you are the most productive how you are the most creative you can learn you know when you're close to getting burnt out what it feels why you're procrastinating what yep. you need to do to counteract that um and you can yeah and that, that helps the process more than for me that has been the one key thing, uh, even more than things like, you know, um, sit in the chair and write every day. Oh, or, listen, you know, I, I, I have I've spent the last 15 years essentially talking about why sitting in the chair isn't enough. Like that you can want you can want to slit your wrists after sitting in the chair. Like it's not going to do it. Yeah. You, this, the, no. the, the psychological it, aspect is everything to me. It, yeah, it, I think sitting in that is that sit in the chair advice can do a lot of damage to people like myself. I realize that it works for a lot of people and that's wonderful. But, but for me, it did, it did a lot of damage because it made me discount a lot of productivity that is not sitting in the oh, chair. For sure. The, the muse yeah. is mm -hmm. on 24 seven. She'll be there. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. she doesn't care whether you say I'm writing or you're doing the dishes. She will talk to you when you're open to hearing. It's yeah, it's honestly um, there are times when walking around the library is work. You know, I'm not saying work in a bad way. I'm saying yeah. work in a, this is a productive thing that I'm That's doing. That's right. Just looking at, you know, the the things people are talking to people, you know, or going on, you know, being being out in the world for me um in small doses um that when i when i'm feeling stuck just other things as well um th that really get your brain moving i mean reading is very important to me um yeah. i do a lot of reading um and i know a lot of writers can't read while they're drafting or while they're editing yeah there's some um, who can't yeah yeah and that i i and again like everybody works differently and um, but for me, and I, I tend to, I mean, I, I can understand how a lot of people can't read while they're trying to, trying to, uh, to draft something. I tend to not read in my genre yeah, while I'm, that makes while I'm sense. drafting, yeah. um, partially not because I'm worried about, um, you know, what, what oh, somebody told me this phrase, what is it? It's like creative bleed or something about where people worry about like some, a book imprinting on your style and ability to write. I don't think that that's that that's a th I don't want to say it's not a thing, but it reminds me of the university students who would come uh, when I was a PhD student and I would teach I was teaching, uh, you know, you teach for the professors, you do the the the, the grunt work, some of yeah, it, you know, but yeah. it's wonderful. It's like you're, you're getting your feet wet. Yeah, I really right. enjoyed teaching. Um, and it reminds me of the students that come that were were really worried because we had this software called Turnitin that would look for um, plagiarism. Um, and we would uh, run all these essays through right. pl plagiarism checker. And there were students just wringing their hands being like, I'm so worried that... I, I, I might have, I was reading accidentally, so much, right. but I might have accidentally plagiarized. 
And I remember talking to my supervisor and saying like, what do you say to them when they, when they come and say this? And he said, the ones who come and they're worried about it are never going to be guilty that's, of doing it. That's right. Because that's plagiarism right. is a very deliberate. It's act. a conscious thing. It yeah. is a definitely. So this idea of like creatively, I understand how people can kind of be like, no, I want a pure mental space where for me, the reason why I don't read within my genre while I'm drafting is simply because it makes me, it, it, there are so many incredible books out there. Yeah, you start comparing. Really chip away. Don't do it. You don't want to do it. Like, you know, you're like, wow, I did not need imposter syndrome in, in you know, at the <laughs> I work very hard to keep that in its own yeah. little box. No, that's smart. Um, yeah. So that's one of the things that, you know, for me, I read, uh, you know, while I'm drafting, you know, cozy crime, I read um, anything else, um, children's fantasy, sci-fi, historical um I, I actually say the the thing I read the least of is literary fiction, but I do uh, make an effort to pick up literary fiction that does appeal to me. Float I, I'm boat. It floats your yeah. boat. Not. I have. To, I just realized at this mm. late moment in our interview mm. what a bad host I am. I have not to this moment actually said aloud the title of your book. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Which is a great title, How to Solve Your Own Murder. So yeah. this is in English <laughs> and, yes. and has been out a week. Well, it'll be a two weeks by the time this goes up. How to Solve yeah. Your Own Murder. So I, I will, in the intro, I will be talking about it. So, but yeah. anyway, awesome. there it is, yeah, people. I, I am right. sorry. I got so interested in you. I That's just okay. forgot to even bring that up. I, I was actually feeling quite relaxed because it was the first time I didn't have to elevator pitch at the start oh, of is it? Yeah. <laughs> i was like oh oh this is refreshing talk. <laughs> see people say gosh she's interesting her book must be and i knew it <laughs> would be you've got i don't worry about you crystallizing you've been moving and changing I, and it's gonna I keep happening it's gonna think, keep happening yeah i think more than anything uh I, I think um, the easiest way not to do that for me, and, and this again comes from just me being, this is just how, this is the person I am, you know, former bookseller and things, but the, I, I think just reading and reading it all, just reading widely, yeah. we've got this, um, we've got this, so I've been absolutely over, like just floored by the fact that my book has been chosen to be on the Tonight Show Fallon, uh, Jimmy Fallon. He did, uh, I I missed that. Really? It's it's well, it's battling it out with these absolutely outstanding books. Get and out of town. Well, the, so everybody's going and voting, uh, you know, your right. book is beaten against someone else's. Wow. And I just want to read everybody else's books. So every time my book's up against somebody else's, so I was like, oh wow, okay. Well, I I mean, I'll look at it as if I were a consumer of 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 this book club. What would I want to read? I certainly don't want to read my book because I've read right, that. Right, right, of course. I'm just voting for everybody. I'm voting for the person who's against me because um, I really don't understand how this works, do you, Kristen? Okay, I, well. I'm not very good at promoting my own work. I I have to say that yeah, it's it's been the spotlight that's happened with that is just I I, I well that's I can't awesome. Believe it. That's awesome. I can't believe it. It's just really, really fun to see him do like, you know, hold up the books and. Ah, oh, that's so right awesome! There. Hey, congratulations! Yeah. Congratulations! Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I, th I didn't say that to promo. I, I was saying it's okay to promo. <laughs> Good Christ, it's okay to promo because you are. It is very unusual to have a late night talk show host promote a murder mystery so i know this okay. will never happen to me again this is probably this is not a lifetime thing I, I but can you tell i'm new at this i just really like books and i i honestly like the one that my my book is up against this week i i was like i want to read this i'm you know, reading that's this. fine but in the meantime I'm gonna, I'm gonna you go just read. you beat the drum for your book it's okay <laughs> it's okay see that people oh sometimes the best yeah. Sometimes the people best at talking about this stuff are the ones who don't want it. So I commend you on that. But listen, <sighs> you are a fascinating person. I'm very happy to hear about you. I did not know about the Jimmy Fallon thing. That is awesome. But I'm not quite done with you. Okay. Not quite. I have no, one no. question. One last question I want you to do is I want you to think about all the writing you've done in your life, both for children and adults. And if it's taught okay. you anything about being a person, it's taught you oh. Oh my goodness. If it's taught me anything about being a person, 
I'm probably going to say a very common answer, but I think that it's something that writers who um, manage to break through into traditional publishing probably all share. And it's taught me a resilience and tenacity. Yeah. Um, it, it really, uh, it, I think that the ability to just keep going and keep pushing even when you know there are, and and there are going to be people who you know are go out of their way to dump on what you do and you kind of just have to go okay that's you know yeah. that's that's part of the game um and you just this resili resilience is is something that it, and it's helped in all kinds of aspects of my life the writing resilience of you know this ba the 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 rocky road of getting traditionally published yeah has um has helped me in so many other capacities because you kind of you know there's a, a, a I did a, a little interview with writers digest and um they I can't remember what question it was that I answered uh this to but they pulled it out as their little kind of blurb quote yeah. that they had in the middle of their thing and I used the phrase roll with the punches and it's just it, I think it is just that like you learn to figure out which problems are going to be big problems, which problems are going to be small problems. And you learn when you're fretting over small problems and you shouldn't be simply because you're overwhelmed. Yeah. And that resilience will always kick in if you, you know, believe that it's there and you, you work to find it. Mm -hmm.